This spring, when Russia invaded Ukraine, fertilizer prices increased in some cases 400%, and global grain shipments sputtered. Our farm didn't feel anything because we don't buy fertilizer, and we don't buy foreign grain. Suddenly, our years of being marginalized by the agri-industrial complex inverted, and interest in our methods and madness exploded. Both farmers and non-farmers began asking, how do we disentangle from the system? Just in time, the darling inventory phrase of recent decades changed to just in case, as supply lines fractured. Culturally, a society detached from menial life tasks like farm chores and kitchen duties suddenly found itself vulnerable to unforeseen fragilities. The food and farming sector goal switched from efficiency to resiliency. In the spring of 2020, as COVID's black swan permeated the world, store shelves went bare. Farmers euthanized. That means they killed and threw away. Millions of chickens, turkeys, and hogs because mega processing plants couldn't maintain operations. At our house, we neither worried nor feared because we had freezers full of meat and a basement full of canned garden produce. I don't say all this proudly. I, I say it gratefully and as a challenge to everyone, freedom comes from participation. We've spent a couple of generations exiting historically normal tasks and behavior from integrating livestock and crops, growing gardens, buying locally, and cultivating domestic culinary arts. We even abandoned breastfeeding for a couple of decades. We thought squeezable cheese and subcontracting kitchen duties to mega corporate entities, replacing decomposition with chemical fertilizer, honey with refined sugar, and butter with hydrogenated vegetable oil would launch us into a new freedom nirvana. But instead, it shackled us, enslaved us to nefarious scientists bringing us fertilizer and menus from laboratories instead of from God's ecological womb. Those of us who continued to participate in historically normal farm chores, garden production, local or biologically grown sustenance, and domestic culinary arts are today enjoying more independence and freedom. You cannot have freedom without participation. Here are two questions to ponder. First, would America's food system have convulsed as violently if instead of 300 mega processing facilities employing 5,000 people apiece, we funneled our food through 300,000 community-scale 20 to 50 employee facilities. The second question is, when rocky disruptions affect our ship of state, would you rather navigate dangerous shoals in a maneuverable speedboat or an aircraft carrier that takes 10 miles to turn around? Let's examine what a food and farming parallel universe would look like by juxtaposing current objectives with the lunatic fringe alternative. I've got 10 of these. Number one, cheap food versus precious food. If one thing defines American agriculture, it is dedication to cheap food. American per capita expenditure on food is the lowest in the world. Our per capita expenditure on health care is the highest. Cheap food promised to give us spendable cash to attend football games and casinos and cruises and movies. It created a love affair with concentrated animal feeding operations, CAFOs, that became incubators for disease. Floating on a sea of cheap energy, these facilities promised mechanized farming and pharmaceutical health. Subtherapeutic antibiotic use created a world of superbugs like MRSA and C. diff. A brand new lexicon burst on the American vocabulary. Campylobacter, listeria, E. coli, salmonella, food allergies, type 2 diabetes. These are nature beaten and abused on its knees, pleading and begging, enough! Instead of God's designed decomposition driving fertility, petroleum-based chemical fertilizers substituted like an intravenous feeding tube replacing edible food. In short, our agriculture system created a dead zone the size of Rhode Island in the Gulf of Mexico, infertile frogs, and three-legged salamanders. And now our life expectancy is dropping. We're addicted to pharmaceuticals. Physical and emotional maladies plague our nation. Perhaps cheap food policy's most damaging effect is on farmers themselves. The primary custodians of our natural resources, not to mention food, feel 
marginalized and unappreciated? When's the last time you heard with a, a school guidance counselor advising, Mary, you're really sharp with great grades and honors credentials. You should be a farmer. Burdened with the unnecessary and ridiculous responsibility of feeding the world, American farmers now number fewer than our prison population. It gives me pause to realize that my book, You Can Farm, would have had a much bigger buyer interest if it had been You Could Be a Successful Inmate. <laughs> Stewarding our air, soil, and water with our best and brightest will only come when we have a precious food policy. That's up to consumers, not farmers. Can you imagine a cheap religion policy? A cheap road building policy? A cheap information technology policy? Dear folks, you cannot abdicate precious food respect without serious consequences. As a culture, we must leave this cheap food universe and get in the escape pod of precious food. Number two, quantity versus quality. Bushels and tonnage are all we measure. By every metric over the last century, nutritional quality plummeted. Today, you have to eat three times as much broccoli to get the same nutrition as you did in 1940. Our farm participated in a pastured egg nutrient study several years ago. The official USDA, I call it the US duh, nutrition label <laughs> for conventional supermarket eggs lists folic acid as 48 micrograms per egg. Our polyface eggs averaged 1,038. Grass-finished beef has 300% more riboflavin than grain-finished. Pastured livestock offer much higher percentages of conjugated linoleic acid. Indeed, only two weeks of grain feeding chases it out of the body on beef cattle. The Bionutrient Food Association is documenting the wildly disparate nutrient content of various foods. In carrots, for example, they found that you would need to eat more than 10 carrots of the worst to get the same nutrition as one carrot of the best. To my knowledge, nobody in the conventional food and farming sector is seeking better quality. They're just trying to fill bins and trucks. It doesn't matter if it's junk. We can all thank Austrian biochemist Justus von Liebig for beginning this downward trend when in 1837 he told the world that all life is simply a rearrangement of nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus, NPK, replacing the magnificent complex relational biological community with simple chemicals denies the human microbiome its optimal sustenance. Sir Albert Howard, who developed the scientific aerobic composting method and brought it to the world in his iconic 1943 book, An Agricultural Testament, wrote, quote, artificial manures, that's what he called chemical fertilizer, leads inevitably to artificial nutrition, artificial food, artificial animals, and finally to artificial men and women, unquote. I would add, who can only be kept alive with artificials. A functional, authentic agriculture requires a focus on quality. Number three, segregated versus integrated. Segregated versus integrated. Throughout history, agriculture required a highly integrated approach because until cheap energy and mechanization, distribution was laborious. You couldn't pack more animals in a house than you could bring in feedstocks and haul out manure by draft power. Indeed, from 1900 to 1910, with the Industrial Revolution well underway, along with rapid urbanization, newspaper editors and city planners feared metropolitan implosion. Dependent on draft power to haul in fodder and livery supplies and haul out manure, cities were sinking under transportational inefficiency. Poop covered the streets. It was on your shoes when you went into the bakery. Travelers drug manure into hotels. Patrons carried poop into restaurants. On farms, the same constraints required integrated systems. Crops required proximate animals in order to receive the blessing of their manure. In 1946, the average morsel of food in America traveled only 40 miles from field to fork. Today, the average is 1,500 miles. And we've gone from a calorie of energy per calorie of food to 15 calories of energy to a calorie of food. We've become that inefficient, or looked at another way, that segregated. 
no longer dependent on nature's fertility. We mine our fertilizer from faraway places to be placed on land that grows crops to be fed hundreds of miles away to animals that are trucked to mega processing facilities for packaged food shipped to the Costco near you. Meanwhile, the historic blessing of manure becomes a liability, clogging our streams and poisoning our groundwater because it's too much in one place for our ecological womb to metabolize. Sir Albert Howard also envisioned diamond cities and predicted water-based sewage systems would fade into obsolescence by the 1960s. He imagined 25 house developments placed in a diamond shape so each diamond, each one, would have access to passive solar heat. The one acre inside the diamond would employ a master gardener and composter who would collect the human excrement each day, compost it, and grow highly nutritious fruits and vegetables to feed the 25 households surrounding the garden. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> Our college campuses should all have a chicken house attached to the back door of the dining hall so kitchen scraps can be converted to eggs on site. All roofs can be guttered to cisterns equipped with pumps operated by exercise bikes in the fitness room. Students could exercise by pumping the water back up on the roof, which would grow vegetables that would cascade down the walls for fresh picking from dorms and classroom windows. The vegetated roofs would cool the buildings enough to eliminate the need for air conditioning. The systems would eliminate, the cisterns would eliminate stormwater infrastructure. The campus would be divided into quadrants, and each day students would wake into an app notice telling them where fresh blackberries, apples, or strawberries were ready for picking, and the students could graze their way across the campus. <laughs> All buildings would have attached solariums, generating passive solar heat and growing cool, hardy, leafy greens all winter, eliminating trucking from California. The campus that institutes these simple, low-tech improvements will be a beacon of hope and help to a world wallowing in hopelessness and helplessness. Could it be Hillsdale? Number four, centralized versus decentralized. People assume that to feed the world, we need big things, big chicken factories, big combines, big fields. No, we don't. A lot of little things can outcompete one big one. I appreciate big and smaller subjective terms, and by U.S. duh standards, our polyface farm is now a large farm, but compared to Tyson, we're a drop in the ocean. On our farm, scaling up is not about centralization, it's about duplication. The difference is profound. The average American farmer is now 60 years old. In the next 15 years, 50%, half of all agricultural equity is going to change hands. That's farmland, equipment, and buildings. No civilization has ever seen that big a change in ownership in peace, only in conquest, like the Huns rampaging Rome. Now, I'm not suggesting the U.S. is getting ready to be overrun by the Huns. Maybe we are, maybe we aren't. But what we're seeing in the geopolitical agricultural landscape is unprecedented. Any business book will tell you that when the average practitioner of any vocation or economic sector is more than 35 years old, that's a sector in decline. In agriculture is now 60. This successional problem isn't because farming is obsolete. It's largely due to the cost of entry for the next generation. When young people can't get in, old people can't get out. For example, if a young person wanted to grow chickens for Tyson, the first item on the agenda is a half a million dollar building. Would you call that an impediment to entry? Compare that to our pastured poultry model, which requires a 10-foot by 12-foot by 2-foot high floorless box containing 75 broilers, that's meat chickens, moved daily across the field. All you have to do is cancel your Netflix subscription for a couple of months, and you have enough cash to build one and enter the chicken business. If you like it, you can build another one with retained earnings. If you love it as much as we do, over time you can build more than 200 of them, debt-free. Dave Ramsey would be proud. America has roughly 35 million acres of lawn and 36 million acres housing and feeding recreational horses. We can spread production over thousands and thousands of places. Not a single confinement animal facility is necessary. We have millions of acres locked up. On our farm, pastured pork and forest housed pigs using high-tech electric fencing and moved every few days exercises the ecology and eliminates 
concrete fans, and despicable manure lagoons. People who embrace pod schools, homeschooling, and educational co-ops know that centralization, which is akin to institutionalization, does not a better education make. The same applies to agriculture. Spread it out. Democratize it. Entrepreneurialize it. 